The ABC Murders, in my opinion, is one of the best Poirot adaptations starring David Suchet. It's also quite accurate to the book. So too is the anime version. When the miniseries starring John Malkovich came out, I wasn't too interested in seeing it. I'd seen other Agatha Christie adaptations scripted by Sarah Phelps, and each new installment seemed to deviate more and more from the book's original plots and themes, not to mention they got darker and darker. Now, Sarah Phelps wrote the screenplay for the 2015 version of And Then There Were None, and for that, a darker tone makes total sense. These others, though, they were meant to be cozy thrillers, not slow-burn tense dramas. I will acknowledge that even if the material isn't my preferred kind of content, all the Sarah Phelps adaptations display an annoyingly high quality of writing. And yes, I'm aware of the 1965 adaptation The Alphabet Murders, and that's all that I have to say about that. That doesn't involve profanity. I honestly don't know whether I ever would have given Malkovich's ABC Murders a chance, but given that I've received multiple requests to cover that one, I guess we're about to find out how the story holds up when given the Sarah Phelps treatment. As always, spoiler warning. The ABC Murders was published in 1936 and is mostly narrated by Captain Hastings. Poirot receives a letter signed ABC, warning him, tauntingly, of a crime to take place on a certain date in a place called Andover. On that date, a woman named Alice Asher is found dead, with an ABC railway guide near the body. The local police suspect her abusive husband, but Poirot fears that the person who sent him the anonymous letter is responsible, and this is the beginning of a series of alphabetical murders. When he receives a second letter predicting another killing, he's proven correct. In the film, which leaves out Hastings entirely, before we meet Poirot, we meet Alexander Bonaparte Cust. He checks into a cheap boarding house. Are you just passing through, or do you expect to be a long-term resident? That all depends. On what? The success of my enterprise. Well, that's nice and ominous. I like it so far. And then the landlady tries to pimp out her daughter, who is noisily having sex with the man in the apartment above. I wonder if this will have any eventual bearing on the plot. Instead of one letter, Poirot receives several. He wants to give them to Inspector Jap, as he does in the book, but here, Jap is retired. He visits Jap, who gives him friendly advice and then has a heart attack and dies. Wait, what? They... they killed off Jap. Okay. Strong, dramatic choice. Can't criticize them for that. His replacement is Inspector Chrome, who was a secondary character in the book and is played by Rupert Grint. Chrome and everyone else at Scotland Yard detest Poirot, another deviation. Ostensibly, it's because Poirot has used his success as a crime solver to elevate his own fame, which has since faded. But more likely, it's due to pervasive prejudice against foreigners. The police won't take his concerns seriously, so the case begins with Poirot investigating on his own. He takes note of the stockings worn by Alice Asher, something he won't pick up on in the book until much later. Poirot also makes a vow to the victim that he'll bring her justice. This is a hint that Poirot's motivation for solving crime is not purely vanity, as has been implied so far. There's another layer to this version of his character. In the book, the bee victim in Bexville is Betty Barnard, a young flirtatious waitress. Not long after, there's a third letter, but it arrives late due to an erroneous address on the envelope. Because of this, it's barely a few hours before the third murder, that of Sir Carmichael Clark in Churston. Each of the killings leaves behind people grieving, whom Poirot and Hastings accumulate into a special legion, working their own angle of the case to catch the murderer. This includes Mrs. Asher's niece, Mary Drower, Betty's sister, Megan, Betty's on-again, off-again boyfriend, Donald Fraser, Sir Carmichael's secretary, Thora Gray, and his brother, Franklin. Sir Carmichael also has a widow, but she's terminally ill and bedridden. Between them all, they're able to place a particular man at the scene of each crime, a shabby, barely noticeable stocking salesman. Departing intermittently from Captain Hastings' narrative, we find that this man is Alexander Bonaparte Cust, who suffers from headaches and was unsettled by the war. Strong hints abound that this is the serial killer. 
The fourth letter arrives predicting a D murder in Doncaster on the day of a horse race. Scotland Yard, Poirot, and his special legion all converge on Doncaster, but a murder still occurs. However, the victim's name does not start with D. There was a man sitting near him in the theater when he was stabbed, a man named Roger Emanuel Downs. The general consensus is that Downs was the intended victim, but it was so dark that the killer got the wrong target. A few people who have observed Cust's odd behavior tip off the police, who go looking for Cust. However, Cust himself, in a strange episode of disorientation, goes to a police station and is booked for the murders. The TV version takes a little longer to get to that point. True to form for Sarah Phelps, most of the characters are made extra mean and petty. Benny Barnard actually steals a pair of stockings from Cust, whose presence throughout the story is greatly expanded, and she's cruel to her sister, who isn't sorry when she dies. Out of all the characters, Thora Gray remains the closest to her book counterpart, although here in the film, Carmichael rejects her advances because he has no romantic interest in her. Mary Drower is left out altogether. As public interest in the ABC case grows, the police realize they made a mistake, but rather than admit it, they pretend that Poirot withheld information. Chrome blames Poirot for Jap's forced retirement, which came about when no information could be found regarding Poirot's career as a Belgian police officer. Chrome thinks Poirot falsified his credentials in order to self-aggrandize, but his tendency to call people mes enfants, something he does do occasionally in the original stories, hints at another former occupation. The girl being exploited by her mother, the landlady, is Lily Marbury, who is actually in the book. Cust pays for her services, but it turns out in his case those services don't involve sex. Book Cust has bad headaches, but for the film those headaches have been translated into intense seizures. Inflicting pain elsewhere on his body apparently alleviates the more severe symptoms, so Cust has Lily gouge holes in his back. This is one of many scenes of bodily gruesome nastiness, which I won't show here. Oh my god, why? The C letter is again delayed, but this time it's because the letter was mistakenly delivered to Poirot's neighbor, and not due to a wrongly addressed envelope. This is a fairly big change plot-wise. I'll explain why later. Another big change is the addition of the character Dexter Dooley, and for this I'm going to give something away early. In the book, the killing of the man in the theater, whose name did not begin with D, was a staged mistake. In the film, when Dexter's rival is killed in his place, it's a genuine mistake on the part of the killer. Another deviation for ABC is that the murderer has chosen towns that Poirot has some connection to, with the apparent intent of establishing a personal connection. The same thing is accomplished when witnesses say they saw the killer wearing Poirot's clothes. In the book, the killer only gets as far as D, but in the film, we get all the way to E. Ernie Edwards in Emsey. Cust wakes up near the body with the murder weapon in his hand, and he's spotted fleeing the scene. The police are tipped off, and they give pursuit. As in the book, Lily attempts to help Cust escape, but he's caught, and in this case he's very nearly killed. In fact, I was sure he wasn't going to make it. As you can see, unlike Agatha Christie's other stories, this is not a traditional whodunit with a closed circle of suspects. Or is it? Because here in the third act, we're told that Alexander Bonaparte Cust has a rock-solid alibi for one of the murders. Poirot announces that there never was a serial killer. ABC was invented by someone who had a motive to commit one murder and wanted to camouflage it among others. In other words, the killer is someone close to one of the victims. Someone in the Special Legion. Remember the third letter, which the killer sent to the wrong address by mistake? Well, that mistake was also staged, because it was essential that the third murder not be interfered with. Sir Carmichael Clark was the primary victim. The killer? His brother, Franklin. Lady Clark could die any day, and when she did, Carmichael was sure to marry his secretary, Thora. That meant that when Carmichael passed away, his fortune would pass to Thora, or to their children if they had any. By killing his brother, Franklin prevented the loss of what he considered his share of the inheritance. When he happened to meet Cust, he found the perfect scapegoat. His first thought was to send anonymous letters to Scotland Yard, but then he wouldn't be able to stage the missending of the third letter. He needed someone with a private address. 
a private detective. There was no personal connection. Poirot just happened to fit the killer's needs. The last murder Franklin committed wasn't intended for Downs or even any specific person. He just followed Cust to a movie theater and stabbed someone nearby so that he could plant the bloody knife on Cust, who would then get caught. After Franklin is arrested, Cust is released, and Poirot suggests that a new pair of glasses might cure his headaches. In the film, the circumstances of the Clark family are all the same as in the book, but since Carmichael would never have married Thora, Franklin's motive is his brother's title. Which makes me ask, why bother to keep all the other elements? Franklin claims he chose Poirot because he wanted to shut people up for their prejudice against him, unlike in the book where he chose Poirot because he, Franklin, is prejudiced. There's no mention of needing someone with a private address. Franklin even goes so far as to say he wanted to win Poirot's admiration. In the book, Megan and Donald end up as a couple, but in the film, once the case is over, Donald comes to Megan and basically says he'll marry her since her sister is unavailable. Her mother loves Donald, so she's enthusiastic. Prior to meeting Poirot, Megan might have accepted this proposal, but thanks to Poirot's sound advice, Megan escapes the situation. Thankfully, it's implied that Lily might do the same with hers. The last we see of her is that she's waiting in the hospital for Cus to wake up, knowing full well he might never do so. The last big reveal is that Poirot's former occupation was that of a Catholic priest, until a tragedy during World War I caused him to doubt his faith. Final Thoughts John Malkovich is not a good Poirot, just as Margaret Rutherford is not a good Miss Marple, although that doesn't stop her from being my favorite. Malkovich does a superb job as this iteration of Poirot. I don't think that Book Poirot was ever a Catholic priest, but I could easily visualize him doing the things he does in this film if he were faced with the same circumstances. Poirot receives a lot of ugly treatment, and he is very cool under fire. He's someone you'll root for and have confidence in, and he never lets bullshit get past him without calling it out. What are you so twitchy for? You better not be doing your own thing. Crime won't like that. You have ransacked my home and removed my personal possessions. Twitchy is the appropriate response. You mustn't think badly of Donald. He is eating cake with your mother, while you, mademoiselle, grieving and alone are peeling potatoes, so I will think what I please. The story itself is quite compelling. My intention was to watch it one episode at a time, but I was so hooked I ended up watching it all in one sitting. Unfortunately, I did not find it ultimately satisfying, part of which was inevitable. I can't speak for all Agatha Christie fans, but one thing I love about her stories is her slight satirical take on the genre. Oftentimes, something that on the surface appears profound is actually quite prosaic. Severe, frequent headaches. Does this mean a damaged psyche? A warped and twisted mind? Nope, just a faulty ocular prescription. Alphabetized murders. A crazed homicidal maniac with an obscure obsession or complex? No, just a greedy son of a bitch who doesn't want to get caught for doing something bad. It's perfectly okay to tell a story with a darker slant, but I think the removal of the story's whimsy is an underrated loss. Tragedy isn't as powerful if there are too many different kinds of it in one story. I didn't need the ending of this one to be happy, I just wanted it to be cathartic, and this felt like a cop-out. Franklin seems to have started believing the gibberish he wrote in his letters to Poirot, the nonsense he came up with to create the illusion of a serial killer. So bloody exciting. I never felt so completely alive than when you were chasing me. Well, if that's the case, it robs the big twist of its importance. The murderer turned out to be exactly what we all thought he was. Of course, maybe he's just trying to mess with Poirot out of spite before he's hanged, but if so, who cares? Either way, why give it so much weight in the final scene? It's almost as if they found themselves five minutes shy of their runtime, so they shot one additional scene and filled it with pointless menace. And that's not entirely sarcasm. This adaptation did not merit three whole hours. Though I admit I'd be more willing to watch three hours of Sarah Phelps and John Malkovich than any hours of Kenneth Branagh's Poirot. My main takeaway is that although an adaptation doesn't have to be just like the book in order to be a good film, it's a shame whenever an adaptation throws away something of value. Thanks for watching. I hope you'll come back for the next one.